Hello, we're here with, here with Bruce Harrell, who's running for Seattle mayor. Would you like to go ahead with your one minute introduction? Well, thank you. And thanks for all of you for introducing or reintroducing yourselves to me. So my name is Bruce Harrell. I'm obviously running for mayor and I ask that you look at my endorsement, uh, endorsing me favorably. I've been a lifelong Democrat and I think my 12 years of public service has consistently proved that I am true to the values of our party. I was the one who introduced the race and social justice initiative uh, to require an equity lens on all the work that the city does. I was the one who, um, who was the lead sponsor on Ban the Box to make sure that people who have committed crimes, uh, that that should not be considered during the in, uh, interview process. I was the one that introduced the human rights legislation to the city, making sure that we are a compassionate city under the Declaration of Human Rights. And I could go on about the kind of work that I do, but it's largely because of the story of my life in Seattle as a native here. And I think that as the mayor, I'll bring those life experiences to the candidates, to my candidacy, and that kind of mayor. Great. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll go into the four prepared questions. Um, and this, the order in which they will go, it would be Barbara, Andy, Sherry, and then Paula. Uh, so I will go ahead and post the first question into the chat. And Barbara, if you would like to go ahead and take that one. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna try, okay. So Bruce, will you com commit to spending all of the emergency, emergency funds appropriated by the council and awarded by the federal government. Please explain your reasoning. I'm sorry, will I commit all of the emergency funds, commit them to be spent on their intended purpose or commit to spend them how? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. To their intended purpose. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think that, um, so yes is a short answer. I guess I could spend two minutes on explaining why, but um, in full disclosure um, on some of the ARPA funds that I've been pretty um, vocal about, I don't think that we are spending enough money of the ARPA funds, the 116 or 118 million we received um, from the federal government and we'll get another batch of it, enough on homelessness. And so I've been very vocal that we should have spent more, but uh, the emergency funds, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're Great. welcome. Thank you. Uh, question number two, Andy. Um, hi, what is your immediate actionable plan for providing sufficient resources to end homelessness in our region? Yeah, so um, I'll, 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 I'll start by saying that I think the right policies are in place right now. Housing first, uh, requiring that we find housing before we move anyone or sweep anyone, that we work on a regionalized approach. Um, now that Compassionate Seattle will not be on the ballot, I will still commit to spending at least 12% of the general sub fund, which is going to be north of $170 million toward homelessness. I also want to spend about 70 to 80% of some of the ARPA funds at a minimum on homelessness. I will also do something that no other candidate has ever talked about doing, and that is I will raise money in addition to every possible sustainable tax resource tax revenue. And I've been um, very vocal there that I will also raise and convince these large corporations that are quite frankly putting brick and mortar institutions out of business that are causing decay in our cities that I'll make sure that they step up and pay their fair share of taxes and philanthropically donate into our community. I've made many presentations where I've said that they have a moral obligation when you are causing this kind of destruction in major cities, whether it's income inequality, housing affordability, um, homelessness, that we will raise that money and house people. I will use tiny houses. I will use transitional housing and I'll be make sure we have the best applied behavioral science, scientists and mental health counselors providing treatment to those in need. So we will have a loving, compassionate, kind approach, but a sense of urgency, because I think right now we are doing uh, the we are not we, our inaction is intolerable, and this is not a dog whistle for being evil to anyone. My personal upbringing would not allow that. Never allow that. So uh, I will be energetic on right. making sure we house the people that are now homeless. Great, thank you, um, Sherry. Question number three, please. 
What is your understanding of the separation of powers and what will be your strategy for working with the other city officials? Well, I think I have a full uh, understanding of the separation of powers. I'll use the, if we're talking about the legislative branch uh, vis-a-vis -vis the judicial branch and the executive branch, but even though there is a by charter a separation of powers and there are some ancillary offices like the auditor or the hearing examiner, even though there are legally a separation of powers, what we have to master is the fact that we have to communicate with one another. We have to be completely transparent. We have to assume positive intent and that they're trying to solve the same problems that we have to solve. So working with the judicial branch as an example, that I'm a firm believer in restorative justice. I cross-examined police officers. I've um, been in the courts. I've tried cases from voir dire to verdict. Uh, I know why many people commit crimes. Some people make bad decisions. Some people are victims of income inequality. And so as I look at the separation of powers, I will probably be the most aggressive one in terms of building relationships. Quite candidly, I have a history of that. Uh, I was, I think, the fourth person in history to be elected the, uh, uh, president of the city council twice. And I say that to say that I was very intentional about building relationships with the city attorney, uh, with the judicial branch, and with mayors, the many mayors that I served with. I, again, I always assume that I have more in common than I don't with people. And so even though I may have some policy disagreements with those in other branches, I will find that 80 or 90 percent that we have in common and we will drive those outcomes. I continue to believe in other people and believe in this city. That's why I think I'm a strong leader. I don't you never heard me when we had 15 candidates denigrate any of my colleagues. You don't see those kinds of tweets coming from me. I don't even pay attention to a lot of that nonsense because that's what's hurting our city, I think, right now, that we're not working collaboratively. Hi. And I certainly will do that. <clears throat> Thank you. And question number four, Paula. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Bruce. Would you support extending the current eviction moratorium past September 30th? and why or why not? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I want to look at the data and just like we are doing for COVID, I want to make sure that we are letting the facts dictate our policy. So we know that many people just cannot pay their rent, that they we do not want them to be homeless, that the best way to, the most effective way to, to uh, prevent homelessness is to keep people in their homes. And so certainly in those situations where we have to extend it, we will. We will also look to see um, whether some small landlords, for example, how, how badly they are hurting. Can they get some relief as well? Because many of them uh, do not have deep pockets. Many of them are still have taxes to pay and insurance to pay. And I think we need to get data from them as well. So under my approach, rather than say it's just going to be a blanket exclusion or a blanket extension, I will open up the conversations, work with housing advocates and rental advocates, as well as small landlords, and we'll come up with the right policies. And I think that's the prudent way to go. I know too many people that are uh, small landlords that are hurting as well. And so we have to have a balanced discussion, but most importantly, we have to keep people in their homes. Great, thank you. And so that is the um, conclusion of the prepared questions. So now we'll go into our follow-up questions. And again, these responses are one minute piece. Um, Alice, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so in one of your responses, um, you said that you would um, really lean on um, the business community to contribute both taxes and then above and beyond what you're asking, you know, the, the um, charitable donation. So how, how do you see, how do you see you getting that done when others have not been able to get that done? Well, I don't think others have tried as hard as I, now let me give you some background. I've done it. I raised hundreds of millions of dollars with my wife, who was the first woman and the first African-American uh, CEO of United Way. I'm pretty darn good at raising money because I make the business argument that this is a win-win for everyone. One part of the Compassion Seattle Charter that I'm asking or demanding that the city look into is to allow tax deductible gifts to be made to the city. So when you say the work's been done before, it has not been done before because one cannot donate money to the city uh, because the charter does not allow that. One can donate money to a 501c3. 
What we have not done is prove to the philanthropic community, and I spend a lot of time in the philanthropic community, um, we have not proved to them that we know how to manage money, that we're spending it effectively. And that's the first part of philanthropy is to make that argument and prove it. That is what I will do. Time. Great, thank you. Uh, any further follow-ups? Mackenzie, go ahead. Hi, Bruce. Um, so I'm pretty involved with the local Seattle music community. And last year, we were uh, pretty much the first ones that got shut down. And then we were the last ones that got to go back to work. With the new Delta variant, unfortunately, it's looking like that's probably going to happen again. And a lot of artists are going to be out of work. Um, do you have any thoughts or ideas on uh, being able to support the music community with uh, some kind of supplemental funding and you know, again with the uh, eviction moratoriums, those kind of things to help to try to support artists. Yes. For, so first of all, I have skin in the game that I am currently managing uh, the property at the Royal Room, which is a music venue, and the Royal Esquire Club, which is another music venue, both of which have been shut down. And these are places where artists can perform their, their craft. So I'm extremely supportive of the industry, but again, I've been doing that frontline work. So to answer your question directly, yes, that, you know, I've talked at the Arch Forum and there's another one coming up. Uh, I don't think my opponent showed up at the first and probably a conflict. So I don't mean that as to denigrate anyone, but I said loudly at that forum that, you know, whether it's building housing for artists, whether it's a moratorium, whether it's again, tapping into the philanthropic community, finding using federal funds, supporting in fact, Council Member Herbold had an amendment that I was, would have supported had I been on the council about, again, putting, putting more money toward the artist. This is an industry that we have to um, support in every way possible, and I'll be very supportive uh, in that regard and have the history of doing it. Thank you. Uh, Andy. You guys are really tight on this time. I got usually you get like five seconds to riff it a little bit, but I'm trying to all is, all is tough on it. It gets harder as we can move on. Uh -huh. uh, Andy, go ahead. Thanks, Nicole. Um, what is the most important police reform that you would pursue as mayor? Well, I think right now, and I think you know my history in police reform. I was the sole sponsor of the bias-free policing law. I was the sole proponent of body cameras where people thought it was crazy to even do. And I have real experience in cross-examining officers. So what the most important thing we could do right now is number one, change some leadership, expog. We have to try to get more civilian auditors or more civilian investigators working in the OPA. We have to extend the, extend the 180 day by which we uh, can complete investigations. And that will be in a bargain for a condition of employment. But I think that's absolutely critical to make sure we have uh, extensive investigations when there's unreasonable force. But I continue to say, and people, uh, I think it's starting to resonate finally, that you can defund the police, you can lower the number of police and do all that work, but if you do not change the culture of the police department, we will not get it done. And I tell people in respect to accountability and um, police accountability, how dare you uh, question my credibility in this work because they don't know my experiences growing up in Seattle. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. John, go ahead. Uh, I'd actually love it, um, sir, if you wouldn't stop there. Can you talk more about how you would, uh, and, and specifically how you would work to change the culture of the police department? Um, I think a lot of folks have made that promise over the years, and I'd love to hear, you know, specific ideas that you might have. Yeah. So thank you, John. So first of all, I publicly said, while I try to assume positive intent in anyone, in everyone that Mike Solon has to go. I don't think he represents kind of leadership in the SPOG uh, labor unit that we have to have. I need a person to be able to encourage the rank and file to speak up when they see someone like George Floyd murdered, that I need the informal leaders in the organization to drive the culture, to celebrate the things we're doing right and denounce adamantly the things we're doing wrong, such as being heavy handed when we are dealing with peaceful protesters. I need leadership from the top to make sure that he or she are leading the way in terms of reform. That again, culture has changed when you celebrate every single day, you talk about, you build trusted basketball games and you're not standing like 
you're not standing like this on the on the sidelines. You are in there mixing it up with the crowd. So we're going to put, I got to stop. So we're going to put some budget in there to create all of this culture change. That's going to drive the outcomes we want. Great. Thank you. Any further questions? I have one from one of our members. Um, it, it's uh, They're asking, what investment can we make to support our youth and their mental health? So, so we had once, um, and first of all, there's so many kids walking around with two things, untreated trauma. They're seeing all this stuff that's going on. They are part of it and they see it and they, they're not getting treatment, number one. And number two, we know that we don't have enough mentors and role models and positive avenues for the kids that are slipping through the cracks. I mean, we could go to Garfield and talk about all the kids doing the APP programs and Roseville doing some outstanding programs programs. That's good stuff. And we encourage that excellence. But there are large sums of kids that just don't have that. So under so we're starting what's called a cell empowerment and opportunity program, where we're going to bring in a whole network of mentors. Number one, we're going to find youth leaders and youth ambassadors within the groups to talk about how they can sort of pull one along and make sure that everyone has a social network, if you will. And we'll find programs in the city, such as DigiGirl, where it's a program where they teach young girls that they can code, that it's not just a man's world looking at gender discrimination in, in uh, training for what routes people go. So we're going to be very intentional about meeting youth where they are and tapping into their gifts. Great. Thank you. Mackenzie, go ahead. Bruce, um, looking for maybe uh, one opportunity to differentiate yourself from your opponent in this race, maybe um, a policy idea that she has that you disagree with and how you would do it different or something that maybe uh, she currently does in her role. Yeah, so I've been trying to, I'll, I'll, I'll try to hum a few bars, but what I've been trying to do is stay on my message because I, you know, I listen to 15 or 14 people um, sort of say negative things about each other. So I don't spend a lot of time looking at uh, uh, Council President Gonzalez's message. I will say that no one has my experience in race and social justice. Nobody. N not any of the 15. In terms of the experiences, the unique experience that I have being a person of mixed heritage, a person growing up in the Central District in the 60s. And I bring a certain skill set, I think, when I look at social justice issues that this city desperately needs, because if we don't solve those issues, that will be the tail wagging the dog that we have to grapple through that because then you look at our environmental justice platform, you look at our need for jobs and job development, you look at the, the even the emergence of white supremacy groups that I bring a unique skill set that this, this city is starving for. Number one, number two, I make decisions. I own decisions. I don't make it as, I, I'm gonna comply with Paula. I follow instructions too. <laughs> I'll go ahead and give you another minute to wrap up that thought. <laughs> so is this my closing minute? Nicole? No, 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 no. I'll just give you another minute to okay. talk about the same topic. Well, um, I, I, in my personal story, people will say, well, this guy, you know, he, he likes to talk about jobs or he's the, he's a business guy and all this nonsense. I'm saying at what point, this is a person that I led the largest gender discrimination case in the state's history that I litigated members of race uh, race discrimination cases against the city of Seattle that I was as a lawyer I only represented the side of good that no one that the power dynamic with me in business is quite lopsided I tell them what I need from them I don't take orders from anyone and that kind of independence this is not a stepping stone for me I retired from politics that is that kind of energy and independence that the city needs right now so you ask what how am I distinguished I'm distinguished because this is my this is this is my end game, and the city needs that kind of decisiveness right now, and that's what I bring. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right, and it looks like we are at our uh, wrap up point. So if you'd like to go ahead and give a one minute uh, wrap up, feel free. Okay, I'll use my one minute, and I'll disclaim that I sometimes don't do it these one minute things. Uh, I gotta develop my my one minute game a little bit, and I've already raced it a half of it. You know, I'm getting tired of the labels in this race. Um, this person's that way, she's this way. Um, it's a shame because uh, I was born here. Uh, there are people on my campaign that I've known since kindergarten and high school and middle school. 
they believe in me because they know that I'm what the city needs right now. Hearing voices of, you know, my mother and father didn't go to college. I grew up of very modest means, and now I can say with confidence, I am capable of being the mayor of the city. It is that kind of breakthrough and, and passion for opportunities for everyone. The people that are living in homelessness right now, I believe I can unlock the doors to help many of them. Some of them, I have to admit, may be chronically homeless, but even that person will get the kind of love and compassion and care and resources that they need. That's the energy <laughs> that I bring, and I don't think anyone else has brought it in the 15 people who run, and that's the kind of mayor I could be. A proven track record that's unequivocal on their stance on justice. That's what I think the city needs. Great. Thank you so much.